I, I always love that I have to at least speak twice because this group is so vibrant and so chatty that it, nobody's just like dead silent waiting for the meeting to start. You have to grab the attention to, to, to get the meeting to start. So that is, is so fun to be part of this group. So um, I'm sorry to interrupt what sounds like an incredibly lively afternoon here, um, but I do want to get us started because we have a lot to talk about and we're so excited for the presentation that I don't want us to, to miss a, a minute of that. So I will officially call the meeting to order. Uh, and I am Cindy Gwelly. I am president this year of, of AOI. Uh, and I want to welcome all of you guests that are here. We have, we have several of them here today. So thank you for, for joining us at what is our very last lunch meeting of 2023. Um, as we, I know, go into 2024 very, very quickly. Uh, we do have a recap of our October meeting, um, and to remind you, that was uh, talking about the D.C. archives um, with Dr. Lopez Matthews, um, and that is uh, summarized in our newsletter that's put on our website and also videotaped and put on YouTube in case you, in case you want to watch that. Um, so we have all of that that uh, if anybody... Unless anybody has some objections, we will take that as our official record for our October meeting. Any challenges, questions about that? It was wonderful. Oh, good. I'm glad, glad you enjoyed it. It was interesting. Can't wait. They did have, if anybody um, also gets their Washingtonian magazine, he was talking to us about some of the, that treasure room that they, are, they have at the archives, um, and in a very kind of grisly October, October fashion, they were talking about the, the electric chair that he mentioned. So they do have an article about that in the Washingtonian magazine. If you want to get a picture of um, what I think was referred to colloquially as Old Sparky, which is not, yeah, uh, makes it even grimmer for that. A, a bunch of announcements. First and, <clears throat> and foremost, this Saturday we have, um, have an event. Um, it is Saturday, it's November 18th, to, to keep the date, so it is this Saturday. 10 a.m., we have a guided tour of the Queen City Memorial um, that has uh, dedicated to the African-American community, Queen City, that was displaced by the government when they took it over um, in order to build the Pentagon. Um, and so we will get uh, the artist, uh, Nikisha Durrett, is going to be there to tell us about the creation of this memorial of the public art project, as well as a little bit of the history of the community. We are going to do something new. So we're going to meet there at, at 10 a.m. Uh, there are going to be, in, there's going to be an email coming out uh, with, with directions and, uh, and information that you can able to, to get you there. Um, and we will have that at, at 10 o'clock. If you have not been there, I have not been there, um, but it is in the same campus as Amazon's new headquarters in Arlington. So, um, so you, you, you can't miss it. It's part of that park, and it's an opportunity to go see that, those buildings as well. It's accessible by metro, both uh, close to the Pentagon City and the Crystal City Metro. Um, there's a bus that stops there, and there is parking there as well. So any way that you might want to get there, it's supposed to be a nice day on Saturday, drier than, than Friday evening. Um, so it should be a nice chance to be able to, to see something that's new, uh, and the artist herself is, is giving us giving us a tour of it. So um, look for the email. Let me, let me emphasize again, it is free. It is a free event. Um, so just come bring yourself, bring your friends. Um, everybody is welcome to, to come to, to be able to get a chance to, to see this. Um, so again, it is a free event, Saturday at 10 a.m. So look into your uh, inbox, and uh, we'll send you some more information on it. Um, and contact us if you have any questions about that as well. Um, we have a, a, another um, opportunity for you to kind of delve a little bit into D.C. history through um, the Women's National Democratic Club's D planner. Yes. So the, their 2024 planner was launched uh, this past week with a, with a reception here, held here. Um, this is, if you remember, a couple of months ago when we were soliciting ideas for D.C. women, notable D.C. women, um, to possibly include in the planner. Uh, they incorporated several of, 
of them that I think uh, were, were named by us, probably also named by some other people um, as well. Uh, and one of them, most especially that I want to point out, um, is related to somebody in the room here today. So our treasurer, Carolyn Michelle, our, our board member, her mother is in the planner. <clears throat> And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to read you the, the entry into this. So this is Charlotte Gordon Chapman. Uh, Chapman came to DC during World War II and worked with a wide variety of DC political and civic boards and activities, including the Convention Center and the University of the District of Columbia. When working as Mayor Washington's inauguration co-chair, uh, Chapman realized the urgent need to preserve D.C. history. With the support of the Council and the D.C. Commission for Arts and Humanities, the Museum of the City of Washington was established with Chapman as president of the board. The museum helped local schools improve teaching of D.C. history and merged with the Sumner School um, archives in 1991. Um, and there's a beautiful picture of her on here as well. So you can take a look. And, um, and also purchase these. Um, they are $20. Uh, you can buy them from Pat um, at the reception desk at the front on your way out if you're interested in um, early holiday shopping and gifts and getting a jump start on, on 2024. Um, and there are some great uh, women that are listed in here and of course such an important year as we're coming into 2024 um, to, keep, to keep note of women who were, have impacted D.C. Um, politically, civically, and, uh, and in history to um, spread this information far and wide. So um, please, if you are at all interested, uh, you can talk to Pamela Johnson in the back if you want to uh, make note of and tell her how wonderful it is, but also purchase it on your way out if you want to do that. Um, we have also this book for purchase in the back that Jen will be happy to help you with to buy um, for $20 as well. All, each book has been signed by both authors, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you are getting, a, you're getting an autographed um, book if you want to purchase that today, also $20. Um, that is, that is the, the number to beat today for that. Of note, uh, we have a sad um, passage to note. Richard Lyons, who was um, an AOI member um, and also notable for a, a discovery in DC that um, I'm going to let Gary, our board member Gary Scott talk about because he was intricately connected to that as well. There you go. Richard Lyons just passed away. His funeral was uh, a couple of weeks ago in uh, Tennessee where he uh, had a house and, and retired with his wife, Sarah. And uh, Richard Lyons was a carpenter from the General Services Administration. And uh, I met him in the 1990s, about 95, 96, when I got a call from the superintendent of Antietam National Battlefield, says, can you talk to this guy? He says he's found Clara Barton's apartment. And uh, so, so I, I, I called him, and, and Richard gave his story that while closing a building up on 7th Street for the General Services Administration, the day before Thanksgiving, he, he went upstairs and, and something struck his attention, and he looked at the ceiling, and there were papers coming out of the ceiling. And uh, so he got a ladder and went up, and, 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 and he started pulling down all of these Civil War period papers and, and magazines and newspapers and, uh, and clothing and memorabilia. And, and finally fell, uh, and he realized that where he was was in the... Uh, the uh, Civil War apartment of Clara Barton, and she was a pack rat, and she kept all she kept everything, and so the 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 attic was chock a block full of Civil War material that authenticated that it was the missing person's office and 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 apartment of of Clara Barton, and so uh, Richard sort of pushed this and. Uh, I went on TV and sort of uh, popularized it through the media, 
and, and we, we got sort of a ball rolling, the Red Cross got involved, and then the, the Civil War Medicine Museum of Frederick, Maryland, finally came in and took over the museum and made it into a museum, which it is today, and you can visit it. It's on 7th Street. So we... So we honor both both his his discovery and without him, I believe the the building was about to be torn down, as well. It was slated it was slated to be demolished, to be demolished. So without that find, um, uh, they they would not. And I believe he also was told when he told somebody that he found something that they told him to just throw it out, so that they so that they would not have to deal with any of this. So, um, so both Gary and, and Richard certainly get a lot of credit for, for helping us to save that and to bring that history back. So thank you to, to both of you. Um, we also want to thank our, our two board members who are, are leaving us uh, as their positions, not leaving AOI, but leaving their positions as board members, both Ned Rich and uh, Marsha Rock, who are not going to be uh, on the board as of uh, November of 2023. Uh, Marsha was instrumental in uh, our speaker series, and she was the program director for that for, um, for about two years. So we, we thank her for all of the, the, the mix of people that she was able to bring to us, and um, really, I think, did a fabulous job of making sure that we had a cross-section of, of speakers and of topics and of interests. So um, neither are here at the moment, but I do want to thank them for, for their service on the board and hope that they'll be back for lunches very, very, very soon. Speaking of membership, um, now is the time to think about renewing. Uh, we were our membership newsletter our letter to encourage you to renew is going to be coming out at the beginning of the year, but you don't have to wait for it. You can go online right now through the members portal and you can renew for 2024. It makes it so much easier. You don't have to cut the, the little piece off the bottom of the paper, put it in an envelope, mail it in, you save a stamp, um, and you can be done and you don't even have to think about it for the next year. So um, while it is on your mind, uh, if you are ready to renew, uh, please make use of the, the membership portal and, and get your re membership renewal in today. Because uh, we have a lot. And a very good, pro we're one of the cheapest groups uh, around to be able to, to join. It's not even, it's like this, the cost of the planner, right, that you're, uh, that you're getting. So it's a great deal, and we've got a lot of great things coming up for 2024. Uh, we have speakers from, on topics from the, the Theater Lab uh, that are going to be coming to talk. Uh, we have our own AOI history that we're going to be exploring with our board members, um, Bill Brown and Sherry Sewell. Um, Civil War Washington is, is up for, for discussion. The Rainbow Project, the 1968 riots. Uh, we've got our DC Collections Roadshow that we're going to be um, co-sponsoring at the Hirak House Museum. Um, other field trips, the Memories of Mimosas. So we've got a lot coming up. So, um, so we'd love to have you back and, and please think about doing that, that early um, so you don't have to get 20 emails from us saying, are you, going to, are you going to renew? Do you want to renew? You haven't renewed? Let's renew. Um, so you can avoid hearing from us from that. Um, uh, and let us know if you have any questions about that, too, certainly. Our next gathering as a group for, for food is going to be the New Year's brunch. Um, and we will be having that again here New Year's, New Year's Day. Um, something different this year. We are going to um, ask you if you would like to contribute and bring a bring a book. Uh, we might all have, we're just talking about all of our stacks of books. If there's one that you uh, have duplicates of or um, enjoyed so much that you would like to pass along, uh, Marsha Rock helps to fill out those little free libraries that you see in, in neighborhoods. Um, and she goes to low-income neighborhoods and makes sure that, that those are fully stocked. Um, so if you would like to bring one with you on New Year's Day, um, she will collect them and she will make sure that those um, go out into the different neighborhoods um, to be used. Cookbooks, children's books are particularly popular, um, but so are novels and history books as well. Um, she has said that people 
actually stop her when she's putting books in the free little libraries, including bus drivers that have pulled over to ask her for a book. So, um, so these are these are well used, um, and it's a it's a good way to um, not only distribute the books that you might have at home, but also to to give back to the community. Start the new year. Start the new year well. Uh, Carol and Michelle connected Marsha with a um, one a local children's book author, um, Gus Aver. I'm going to mispronounce his name, Avercodos, um, who wrote a children's book called The Whale's Tale, um, and he donated 25 copies um, for these free little libraries. Um, so, so we thank him, and um, we know that we can um, do even more for them. And of note. The Hotel Harrington is closing, if you did not hear that. <laughs> I'm not, it has been around um, since 1914. Uh, it's closing next month, so is Harry's Bar. As part of that, there's no word yet on Ollie's Trolleys. Uh, it, it, that too, it's all going, it's all going. So this has been in the fam same family, apparently, all these years, and I guess there's, there, there's no word as to what's gonna happen to it, but I believe they're selling the property, right? That they're. That, that, that we've heard. Um, it was, uh, which I didn't realize upon reading, reading this, that in the 19, late 1940s, um, there was a television station that broadcast from the Hotel Harrington that ended up becoming WTTG, uh, Fox Channel 5. Um, so you're saying, yeah, did, did anybody, there also was a, a dance show that, um, that was broadcast from there. Um, what was it, the Milt, am I getting, the Milt Grant show, yes, was anybody on it? You were, you were on it uh, to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you remember that? Sorry, that's awesome. It's there. So, um, so it does have a, a, a lot of history. We're sorry, to, sorry to, to see that go in terms of the uh, in terms of the history. It was, um, and so we're look, look for what might happen. Changes, changes, changes. But what might happen to that downtown that downtown location? Last last note. Here at the WNDC on December 20th, um, they are going to have a, a tribute to Judy Garland. It is the Steve Washington Quartet um, at 6.30, uh, and it is $40 for a reception and for, for the music. Um, kind of connecting that to the holidays with Judy Garland's Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, um, and there will be um, a full-on tribute. So if you are interested in that, that is happening on December 20th to kind of kick off or that's probably in the middle of your, your holiday celebrations, um, but that'll be here. So that's a lot. Um, so today, I'm going to, right now, I'm gonna pass it on to Nelson for our trivia, trivia question, and then we will get to our, our presentation. I lied because I have one more. Um, while, while, while Nelson is making his way up, um, the Foggy Bottom History Project um, is now has an online section of the DC, if you go to the DC History uh, website, uh, you can go to their digital resources and you can click on a map of, it's a four block area, am I getting this right? A four block area where you can click on any uh, block that was a house in that area and get the history of that house. Um, and so, frankly, Leone and, um, and uh, Denise Voigt, am I saying your names right? I'm sorry. Close enough? Leon? Leon. Leon. I'm, I'm making him Italian, more Italian. <laughs> Frank, Frank Leon. Uh, are, have co-chaired co the project, the Foggy, Foggy Bottom History Project, and are working on building even more information about it, but it's, it's full of information, and you can find it both at the foggybottomhistoryproject.com or foggybottomassociation.org or the DC History website. Nelson. Okay. Well, of course, you all know Washington has many, many memorials. <clears throat> but there was a president, uh, I want you to name the president, who left very strict instructions that if a memorial was ever to be built in Washington, it would have to be simple. It would consist of a block of granite or 
limestone from Vermont or New Hampshire, about the size of his desk. And on this block it would say his name and in memory of and nothing else. What president were we talking about? Oh, we got a lot. Of, I thought this would be easy. Who, who was the first over here? Me. Okay. <laughs> you got it. Well, the rule was you didn't win before, right? Never. Never. But I forgot to mention that. If you've already won a trivia question, you, uh, <laughs> you. Now, how I got into this, when I was a junior staffer, I was only at the Library of Congress, Congressional Research Service, for three weeks. And I got a request about this monument which is uh, it down, it's still there. I went down to check the other day to make sure it hadn't been moved because, as you know, they built a huge memorial now in Foggy Bottom to FDR. And <clears throat> the uh, family was going to testify. There was a commission, and they had this big monument plan, and the family was against it. And they wanted to know about the origin of this, how FDR who he imparted this information to and when, and I researched it. And it was, he, in 1941, he called Felix Frankfurter into the White House to have a chat about this. And he gave Frankfurter these instructions. Well, for, two, for 20 years, it wasn't carried out because there was this Congress in the meantime that created this commission to come up with a monument. And they came up with several designs, all of which were opposed by the members of the Roosevelt family. So Frank Fritter and his colleagues got together and said, well, it's time, we'll do this. And they did. They created the monument and got it put in place in 1965. And, uh, but the commission went on and on, and finally we've gotten this huge thing. I haven't been down to see it yet. Has anybody been down to see the, <laughs> to see the new... The new uh, <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> well, maybe I, maybe I didn't want to see it. <laughs> okay, we've got a winner. Good. I said I don't like cheating. Oh, okay. I love winning, but I don't like cheating. Okay. Okay. Okay, we have a new winner. Okay. <laughs> you haven't won before, right? Okay. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. I I have to admit that I the the F, the new FDR is one of my favorites over there. I love to watch people go and pet Fala's head, and you see how shiny it becomes. It's all brass and shiny. I love to watch that. And they all stand in line to take pictures on the bread line, which is a little little morbid, but um, but but still, it's great to see the people using that. Now we ex I'm very excited to get to our presentation today. So I want to introduce um, introduce our speakers um, and and um, uh, get get to our program. So we have we have two speakers today. Uh, first we have we have James Fisher, who is a retired federal employee of the Smithsonian Institution as well as an Army veteran. He is also a seventh generation direct descendant of Captain George Pointer. Uh, and George Pointer, uh, his lifespan was 1773 to about 1830-32. So if you, if you don't know him, there, there, there's a reason. Uh, it was a while ago. And he has been um, working with his colleague, Tanya Gaskins Hardy, as well as historians and local government officials to tell the story of Captain Pointer and his descendants who were evicted from their land on Broad Branch Road Northwest in Chevy Chase, D.C. in 1928 due to racism. James is also a member of the board of the historic Chevy Chase, D.C. Um, Tim Hanapel grew, grew up in Chevy Chase, D.C. and attended D.C. public schools, Lafayette, Deal, and Wilson, now Jackson Reed. 
Um, he recently retired as, uh, from a career as a lawyer for the National Treasury Employees Union, uh, where he represented federal workers in 35 federal agencies, including the National Park Service. He has a longtime interest in DC history and is a board member at historic Chevy Chase DC, helping tell the story of the black residents of Broad Branch Road who had their home seized under eminent domain in the late 1920s to build the the, the um, then all-white Lafayette Elementary School. Tim was instrumental in the campaign to rename Lafayette Pointer Park and Rec Center in 2021. He also helped lead the four-year campaign to rename Woodrow Wilson High School to Jackson Reed High School. Um, so we welcome, welcome both today. I think we turn it over to Tim. Thank you so much, Cindy, and thank you everyone for coming today, especially James, who's sitting right there. Wave, James, hey. Uh, I'd like to, um, thank you, thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to thank several of the guests who are here, um, in addition to my family, uh, the artist Richard Swartz, who's at the table there, who you'll see his painting, uh, the amazing graphic artist Carol Kane, who is also a member of the Woodrow Wilson class of Blah, blah, me and <laughs> Car Carol and, and Carol and I were all in that same class. Um, I'd like to thank the author and architect Neil Flanagan, who did a lot of this work, and uh, you'll hear more about his work around Reno. Uh, and uh, this whole project for me got started at a talk that Neil gave in 2018, which is when I first met James and Tanya. I'd like to recognize James's sister, uh, Shirley and Susan, who are here with us today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and finally, I would like to thank Jenna. Hey, Jenna, way in the back, from the Georgetown University Press, uh, who is here to sell books. Uh, an amazing bargain. I think I paid 30 for mine. They're down to 20 now, so that's a bargain. And um, the royalties go to a special fund that's administered by Historic Chevy Chase DC to promote the legacy of George Pointer and the residents of Broad Branch Road. So when you buy that book, you give a little bit to a good cause too. I'd like to first uh, bring greetings from our two dear friends, uh, Tiggy Green, and, um, and Barbara Torrey, um, who are the authors. They are dear friends and neighbors from the Brookmont, Maryland neighborhood that sits just above Lockhouse 5 and 6 on the CNO Canal. When they were researching and writing about Brookmont together, they discovered George Pointer's 1829 letter in the archives, 11 pages that I'll tell you more about. And they realized it was pure historical gold. That was in 2009, and they've been researching and writing about Captain George Pointer and his descendants for the last 14 years. Um, we owe them a huge debt. Here they are, uh, just last month at the Great Falls, Virginia National Park Service, 250th birthday celebration hosted by Superintendent Charles Cuvalier and Supervisory Ranger Fernice Sewell, who is here with us today. Fernice, I meant to, I meant to thank you at the top. But uh, for Nice, we'll see some pictures of that reconciliation effort. Um, I just want to, the, the, the structure of my talk today is I'm going to do the nuts and bolts of the history, and then I'm going to invite James up. Uh, I do the nuts and bolts, and James is the heart and soul. Um, so uh, I'll invite James up. We'll have a few questions, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. But let me take you through, first of all, um, Who's good at math? Well, I already told you, 250 years, right? Is, this, is that the, Fernice will know, semi-sesquicentennial? semi Semi-quintencentennial. Semi Thank you, Neil. Um, so we're going to take you through the history, and I'm going to dwell a little bit on that. And then I have all these reconciliation efforts, because that's the uh, ambitious title of my talk, how an untold story became a movement for reconciliation. I think we can see it really has become a movement, so I'm going to talk about what happened at Lafayette Pointer Park, what happened at Great Falls that Fernice worked on. Uh, we're going to talk about the UDC Oral History Project, the Black Broad Branch Project, and we're going to finish up with uh, my organization, Historic Chevy Chase DC. We have an online 
online museum and we have events and it's a lot of cool stuff. A lot of the sourcing for this is come from a companion website uh, called betweenfreedomandequality.org. It's for teachers, it's for students, it's organized by chapter. It's really great and a lot of downloadable material. And in a minute, I'm going to tell you about how it's, it's going on its way into the social studies uh, curriculum of DCPS, which is great, which is really great. Um, the story is... It, it's funny to call it an untold story because now it's being told quite a bit more. So I think any story where you're going to talk about 250 years of history, a little ambitious, but I always like to start with a good map. Um, so this is an amazing map from the book, downloaded from the website, Territory of Columbia, 1794. That is a map, right? Now, there's not a lot of detail on this map. We can see L'Enfant's plan. See the little squigglies? Hey, I'm going to try out... Uh, Wow, look at that. There's L'Enfant's plan, okay? Now, L'Enfant's plan was only published, I think, two years before in 1792. Not by L'Enfant, but by Andrew Ellicott, but I digress. But even in the two years since that, that, that D.C. was established, we can already see two amazing events in the life of George Pointer. George Pointer was born enslaved in 1773, right near that little... It says PM House, Presbyterian Meeting House, and it's very close mm -hmm. to Cabin John. That, I believe, is River Road right there. Yeah. Uh, and it, it connects to Wisconsin Avenue, which I think back in the day was called the Rolling Road because they would roll the casks up and down the road to the Port of Georgetown. So, but you can already see it's uh, born in 1773. Now George Pointer is 21, and you see this little word down here? It says Canal. Canal, that's the Little Falls Canal that was part of the Potomac Canal, okay, that George Pointer worked on. He's only, only 21. He's already worked for the Potomac Canal since he was 13, okay? We'll get to that history in a minute, but that's an amazing map, okay? Now, we're going to have another amazing map because, of course, when you talk about the descendants, you have to talk about his granddaughter, Marianne Plummer Harris, who settled in Chevy Chase, Chevy Chase, D.C. That's how the story gets from the river up to Chevy Chase, D.C. And that is Mary, uh, Mary Ann Plummer Harris. It says Harris right there in 1894. And we can see already what's happening. There's the street grid of Chevy Chase, Maryland. And you can see Chevy Chase Land Company. Uh, Chevy Chase Land Company. And there is the Harris Farm right along Broad Branch Road. So that's 1894. So that's map number two. Here's map number three. Uh-oh, look what's happening. It's 1925. Folks, uh, here's the street grid for Chevy Chase, D.C. And here in purple is the black-owned community uh, that became the target for the white citizens of Chevy Chase, D.C. We want to build a school, and we want to get rid of the black folks at the same time. And I'm not just saying that because I'm going to show you some in print, and there it is, 6.2 acres. If you've ever been up to Lafayette Elementary School and Lafayette Pointer Park, it's beautiful. It's 12 and a half acres, and that is one of the largest footprints of any elementary school in D.C. Why is it so big? Because they had to build a school, and they had to build a park to get rid of the black folks. And anyway, um, but that's, that's from 1925, and that's three years before the homes were lost to eminent domain. All right, so those are the maps. Let's back up a little bit. Who was George Pointer? And uh, thanks to the efforts at uh, Great Falls, uh, we now have this exhibit, this lovely exhibit. Ooh, I gotta catch up. I gotta catch up. So let's go back to talk about Captain George Pointer. We know a lot about him from his 11 page letter. Uh, there's an excerpt of it right there. Uh, his petition dated September 5th, 1829. Uh, to the Board of Directors of the CNO Canal, in which he recounts his own history, being born enslaved in 1773 on a plantation near Cabin John, his purchase of his own freedom at the age of 19, and his 40 plus years of employment, 40, 43, I think exactly, including as supervising engineer uh, of George Washington's Potomac Company. Supervising engineer, he was appointed in 1816 because this man knew the canal and the river like the back of his hand, okay? Uh, in March 2019, after a lot of lobbying by James and Tanya, and I helped a little too, uh, the Park Service included 
this signage. Uh, previously, there had been, um, if you ever go to the Great Falls Visitor Center, did you ever do a diorama when you were in, in elementary school? And they have a diorama there, and it's pretty cool. It's these four big wax figures, right? And pretend that sign isn't there, but you push a button and a little light goes on. And above the light and the, the first guy talks, I'm a surveyor. I'm wearing a three-pointed hat and I have some instruments. And then a light goes on above a woman. I'm so-and-so and I run the tavern. And then a light goes above the third one. I'm an Irish laborer. All of those three people are not real. They're just composites. There was a woman who run the, ran the tavern. And then the light goes above this person at the end and the letter. And he says, I was born enslaved in 1773 and it's from the letter. It's from his autobiography. It's from the letter. And until 2019, it was not attributed. And so when James and Tanya went there the first time and they, the light came on, they were ticked off because they knew immediately it came from the letter and it wasn't attributed. So that's one of the first things that we fixed. And I'll just read you what the, you know, if you, if you ever get to work on signage in DC, you should work with Frenice at the National Park Service, because when the National Park Service puts its mind to something, they know what they're doing. And if you can't work with Frenice, then you should work with Carol Kane, uh, the graphic artist. Uh, Carol helped us with our signs at the park. And Carol, have you ever been around the cultural tourism, the walking tours in DC? Carol did about half of those. They're pretty amazing. So she really knows what she's doing. And the, the sign says, who was George Pointer? Captain George Pointer is directly quoted in this audio exhibit unlike the other characterizations displayed here. He was one of the first enslaved laborers rented to the Potomac Company at age 13, age 13, and they put him in charge of the blasting powder. 13-year-old enslaved boy in charge of the blasting powder. And I know you chuckle, but listen, he was so good at his job, we're going to show you what they did. He purchased his freedom at age 19, continued working on the canals for 40 years, became superintendent, this is not in the, he became superintendent at 18. He supervised the entire work staff, including many, many white workers of the Potomac Canal Company, for its last period of operation until it uh, failed in 1829. But when it fails, you know, people loved canals. So it wasn't such a failure that people said, let's not build any more canals. People said, let's build a better one. And that's the story of the Sino Canal. Okay, he was mostly self-educated and was the last superintendent of the Potomac Canal before its charter was transferred to the CNO Canal. Great Falls Park staff is currently working with seventh generation descendants of Captain Pointer to reconcile this untold story. And that's where that language came from that I like. So what the uh, 1829 letter, as well as other sources, tell us is that George Pointer was a hugely accomplished person having purchased his own freedom at the age of 19 going on to have an extensive career. We know that Captain Pointer established himself and his family and therefore his descendants into freedom during enslavement. He married a woman, Elizabeth Townsend, who was also free. Um, uh, and that's very unusual given the overwhelming prevalence of slavery at that time. We also know that Captain Pointer was a master of the Potomac River, so much so that when it came time to break ground on the CNO Canal in 1828, uh, the most important public works project of the day, although Erie Canal was three years later. People loved canals then. Captain Pointer played a big role in the groundbreaking. In fact, it was Captain Pointer who piloted the boat that carried President John Quincy Adams and his entourage to break ground on the canal on July 4th, 1828. Now, there was apparently a very intrepid eight-year-old girl who helped with the piloting, and I'm going to tell about that next. So that's Captain Pointer. Oh, if you go out to the Great Falls, you'll see this painting. Look at that. I mean, look at, the, look at the Great Falls. Whose idea was it to build a canal around that? But they did. And so you can see, here is the holding basin. This is what was called Matildaville. Here's the wing dam, and here are the locks, locks, locks. Look at this one. It's 25 feet tall. Stupendous. I mean, just incredible. Okay. Um, so George Pointer built the canal on the Great Falls side, but first he built the canal on, on the, the Maryland side. And that is, that's the canal right there. This is the CNO canal, okay? This is just from Google Maps. And that little red point is the powder magazine that he was put in charge of and built for him, and they built his cottage there too. So his cottage is right here, and the powder magazine, and here's Lock House 6. And this is Barbara and James and Tanya in about 2018. So go out there, it's easy to find. All right, 
Now we're gonna fast forward 100 years. You ready to go from 1828 to 1928? But this picture, this photograph from the Washington Post covers 100 years of history, so I like to, I like to include that. Yeah, because you want to read the caption, but I'm going to read the caption to you because the caption is amazing. Uh, one of the very few pictures of any of the homes that made up the black community on Broad Branch Road Northwest. But what a picture it is because it brings together 100 years of amazing history of Captain George Pointer and his descendants. It's also a picture of Mary Harris, Mary Harris, his granddaughter, and Mary Moton. Not, it's grainy. Uh, this Mary Harris is Mary Moton's mother, Okay. Uh, and it's, it's from the Washington Post, June 2nd, 1928, with this fact-laden caption that reads, I know you can't read it, I'm going to read it to you, Canal Child, Mary Moton, 73-year-old daughter of the Mary Harris, the, it uses this article, the, the Mary Harris, who piloted President John Quincy Adams and his party up the old Potomac Canal to the groundbreaking of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal 100 years ago. She lives at 5803 Broad Branch Road, Chevy Chase. And it even has the name of Hugh Miller, post staff photographer. A couple of points. So this picture, we believe, accompanied a story in the Post the same day, uh, 1928, about the citizens of Georgetown and their commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Sino Canal. The only picture related to that story is this one. Mary Harris would have been eight years old uh, in 1828, and she helped her grandfather, Captain George Pointer, who was doing the actual piloting. But we can see that 100 years later in 1928, the story of Mary Harris, the Mary Harris, was enough sufficiently well known that the Washington Post sent a staff photographer out to Chevy Chase to take this amazing picture. And it was only about a month later, in August 1928, that Mary Moton's home was taken by eminent domain and was demolished. So Mary Ann Plummer Harris... Let's talk about her for just a minute. She was born in 1820, settled along Broad Branch Road in what is now Chevy Chase, D.C. with her husband, Thomas Harris. In the 1850s, they bought a 2.3-acre farm known as Dry Meadows, part of a small community of free black landowners comprising 6.2 acres. Here she raised eight children just across the road from the Belt Plantation, where enslaved men and women toiled. She sent her two sons, John and Joseph, to fight for the Union in the Civil War and was a pillar of the community. Now, here's the article that accompanied the picture. And it's weird, it's not microfished. Neil found it for us in the archives. And when we say archives, we mean the DC archives that's in the horse barn. Um, And uh, Neil found this attached to a real estate broker's letter to someone else saying, hey, we better, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, we better get moving on this transaction. Uh, We need to buy this lady's land for the school. Uh, So this is an interview of Mary Moton, and we believe it appeared on the Washington Post the same day as the picture in connection with the 100th year anniversary of the Cedo Canal. In the interview, she tells the story of her mother, Mary Harris, piloting the boat that took President John Quincy Adams to the groundbreaking for the canal in 1828. She would have been eight years old at the time, and the interviewer, then 18, she got the dates wrong, or he. And also Mary Moton was 73, so she might have gotten the dates wrong. This is a classic example of oral history, Um, okay? Some interesting facts here. The older Mary, quote, died a short while ago at the age of 103 years, still clinging to her pipe and tobacco. Whoops. (laughs) Still clinging to her pipe and tobacco. Okay, there she is. So this gives them some base to believe the inside, okay. Uh, Quite amazing. Uh, We can see also that she subdivided her two and a half acres farm to her five surviving children before she died. And if you look at, if you read this, this is on the Historic Chevy Chase DC website. You can read this. It talks about the wondrous turning of the golden spade, John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams writes, he wrote a diary and he wrote about this day. He had trouble. He hit a root. He hit a root and he couldn't, he had to take off his shirt and dig and dig and he finally got the dirt. He turned the wondrous, and so the old woman told of dancing with the president, but whether she meant personally or to group, her children cannot tell. 
Her tale of the wondrous gleaming gold spade that turned the earth, however, they recall vividly. They also remember the tale of the wondrous barbecue. A lot of wonder. Wondrous barbecue. It was at this barbecue that their mother and father met. Now, they would have been eight or ten years old at the time, but who's to say, right? So pretty amazing. Hundred-year anniversary. All right. Now, I want to just spend, I know I'm taking too much time, but I'm going to fly through these reconciliation slides, but I want to tell a little bit more about Marianne Plummer Harris. Okay, born in 1820. Now, we talk about, we, we like to think that, you know, the history of, of race relations is, a, you know, the arc of history that bends towards justice. Uh-uh. No, it's a series of, a lot of times, one step forward, two steps back. George Pointer bought his own freedom at the age of 19 for $300. He never carried He didn't have a certificate of freedom. He didn't need it. He lived in a small town in a village. Everyone knew who George Pointer was. His children didn't need it. His granddaughter needed it. Because remember what happened in 1831, the Nat Turner Rebellion. Nat Turner, the Bible, he rebelled. White people got killed. And then all of a sudden, it's time. uh Uh-oh, we need to know who's who. I mean, it's not, it's not saying that George Pointer lived in a paradise. He couldn't own a dog. He could not pick blueberries without a license. I mean, some crazy laws that restricted black folks. So this is the Certificate of Freedom, November of 1838. Mary Ann Plummer Harris was 18 years old. She had just met, married Mr. Harris, Thomas Harris, and she was about to have a child. So why would it have been important for her to have her Certificate of Freedom? She needed to establish herself and remember that slavery passed by the mother. We can talk about rape. Oh, I forgot to say, I forgot to tell you an important fact about Captain George Pointer in 1773. He was born at the plantation brother's industry owned by William Wallace and his brother. There was another child born in that household in 1773, a white acknowledged child named Charles Wallace. Two little boys born the same year, maybe half brothers or related because George was sometimes known as Yellow George. And we're about to see what then 65 year old Charles Wallace, okay? So Mary Ann Plummer Harris needed to go to court to have two, two witnesses swear to her freedom And here, Charles Wallace states that the bearer, bearer, great wording, this is from the books, it's not the actual document, Marion Plummer has asked if he knew anything of her grandmother, Elizabeth Townsend, also Pointer, and her mother, Mary Plummer, the daughter. Wallace certifies that he knew them when the old Potomac Company began its operations at Little Falls and was acquainted with them until they died. They always passed as free persons. Maria Brown swears that she is a free person. Maria Brown was a midwife, a white midwife who delivered many children, maybe delivered Marianne Plummer. But Charles Wallace had to ride down from, from Cabin John, probably an all-day ride down to downtown D.C. to the court to swear out this affidavit for the granddaughter of his half-brother, dear friend, and of course, when Charles Wallace learned to read and write when he was a little boy on the plantation, George Pointer learned to read and write, too. Very, very unusual, and maybe only a member of the family would have learned to read and write. So that is her Certificate of Freedom, an incredible document. All right, fast forward to the Civil War. We're going to move a little faster now. Um, This is Frederick Douglass's recruiting broadside in July of 1863. Remember that uh, the Harris's farm was right across Broad Branch Road from the Belt Plantation. So I like to think that the Harris brothers, John and Joseph, might have seen this recruiting poster and thought of their neighbors across the road. They joined. These are their muster documents. This is um, is John Harris's Certificate of Freedom from 1860, and here are the military records of Joseph Harris and John Harris. They joined the first... I know there's some Civil War buffs in the room. I know there are... They joined, uh, they were 17 and 21 when they joined U.S. Color Troop Regiment 1 in dis- of the District of Columbia in July of 1863 as soon as they could. As soon as they could. Uh, they trained on uh, Mason Island. Here's a picture of uh, U.S. C- Regiment of Color Troops, Mason Island, taken by Matthew Brady. We don't know who is actually in the picture, but that is the Regiment of tra- Black Troops. And they were both injured. Uh, in the fighting. They both fought in the Battle of Petersburg. They were injured, and they were mustered out. So that is John and Joseph Harris. Okay, I'm going to give you one more history slide, but it's another doozy. Okay, along the way of doing this reconciliation work, we met up with another family 
who is descended from the Black Broad Branch residents. Uh, we were lucky to be contacted in early 2021 by descendants of the shorter Dorsey family. They lived right next door to the Harrises and Motons at 5801 Broad Branch Road, where the Lafayette Elementary School basketball court is located today. Jocelyn Julian, who contacted us, is the family genealogist whose grandmother, Anna Shorter Dorsey, was born on the Bright Branch Road property in 1905. 1905. She, was, uh, she lived... Uh, she was an avid photographer. She had a Kodak Brownie camera, and she took pictures when she was a teenager and in her 20s. She lived to be 102 years old and played tennis into her 90s, Jocelyn told me. Um, here is one of the photos she took with her Kodak Brownie of Willie and Rosie. This is the backyard at Broad Branch Road. You can see the big trees. Um, and um, the shorter Dorseys were the last holdouts to have their home and land seized in 1931. And this is the uh, Evening Star article that talks about it. And I quote, the presence of this house with its colored occupants so close to a white school is a source of possible friction that is thought desirable to remove, unquote. Listen to that language, a source of friction. All in the past, it is thought desirable. So think, of, think about that, right? That was Assistant Engineer Commissioner H.L. Robb. Avoiding friction was a rationale that was commonly used to justify Jim Crow segregation. And as an example of that, Woodrow Wilson segregation of the federal workforce in 1913, he told black activists, civil rights activists in the Oval Office, that segregation was, quote, not a humiliation, but a benefit. Not a humiliation, but a benefit. All right. Those are the history slides. I'm taking too long, you guys. I got to get James up here, but let me go through some rec reconciliation slides. I want to first recognize that the first group to reconcile this history was James and his family. James and his family. Uh, eight years ago, in 2015, they held a, when they learned about uh, George Pointer and the black community on Black Branch, they got the word out to the rest of the family. And then after six months of planning, they held a family reunion uh, and picnic to celebrate the family and their illustrious ancestry. This, picture was taken up the hill at the park and shows you how excited everyone was to come back to the home place. And in a few minutes, you can ask James about how that came to be and what people thought. Okay, quickly, historic Chevy GCC, we conducted a petition drive. And as you can see, it was before the pandemic. And we used posters that I brought, and they're in the back of the room back there. You can see, you know, support Lafayette Pointer Park. We had maps. We had the picture. Uh, we got 600 signatures in about 30 or 40 days. No one knew about this history. It was totally untold. And along the way, someone suggested, in fact, it was the chief of staff of Brandon Todd, who was the Ward 4 council member. She said, why don't you get the name changed? And that was a really good idea. Maybe we should have just named it Pointer Park. We probably should have in retrospect. But it was a really good idea because if you change the name of anything DC, it has to go through the ANC, advisory neighbor, then it has to go to the DC council, has to get signed by the mayor. And that means you gotta convince a lot of politicians. And you get to talk to the elementary school students. Remember that, James? Yep. We talked to the elementary school students. This is Black History Month in February 2020, about a month before the pandemic hit. One of the favorite things that we've did. And those students, I got to tell you, I hope you guys have insightful questions because those fourth and fifth graders, they asked a lot of good questions. <laughs> and two of the students, well, I will tell you, um, they started a letter writing campaign and about 15 or 20 students wrote letters to the DC Council. Uh, I wish I had the quote, um, um, Penelope Mason, uh, uh, she asked a lot of questions. She would like, ooh, ooh, Mr. Fisher, Mr. Fisher. You know, she's one of those kids who asked. And at the end, she came up. And I said, why don't you, you've asked a lot of questions. And there was another kid. I said, come up and ask. She said, I'm Penelope Mason. What is your question, Penelope? Have you ever thought about turning this into a documentary? She was a funny kid. And she wrote letters and testified. And here is all of us testifying at the D.C. Council. Um, there is, uh, that's Penelope. And that's Marley. And there's James. And there's, um, uh, there's Barbara and Tiggy. Here's Phil Mendelson. Uh, there's a whole group. And Phil Mendelson really fell in love with this story. OK, so fast forward to 2021. We had a grand opening at the park. It was a great day, June 12th, 2021. These are the pointers from Annapolis, Maryland. They came down. There were about two or 300 people there. It was a great day. Uh, we had a lot of fun. A lot of politicians came. There's Janice Lewis George. There's Phil Mendelson. There's the mayor. Um, there's some ANC people. We had shirts printed up. 
Those are our lime green historic Chevy Chase DC shirts. And we had, uh, there's our friends um, Marley and Penny giving little speeches. And here is uh, the painting. The painting, you guys, the painting. You see that painting? Um, that was the painting that we had commissioned uh, by our friend and, and artist Richard Swartz, who's here today. And um, at the 250th, uh, at, uh, someone got up and said, you know, every good story needs a good image. And that's our image. Um, and you can see in a few minutes that the National Park Service liked the image too. What it shows is it shows Captain Pointer and his granddaughter, Mary Ann Plummer Harris, at age eight, piloting the US president. You can't see it, but in the back, there's a replica of the poster right back in the back of the room. Um, there is the 1828 version of the US Capitol. When you're an artist, you can take license and you can put the Capitol in the picture from the canal, even though that's not possible. <laughs> and over here is the boot and the wondrous golden spade. That's the president. But he was not the main part of the story. These two were the main part of the story. Um, we're we're, we're going to keep going. So it was an amazing day, a beautiful day. Uh, there is one of Carol's amazing signs. Uh, like I said, if you want to make a sign in D.C. and you don't have the park service, you better get Carol Kane. Uh, and that is, we use the theme segregated by design. Segregated by design. That's the title of a book. It's, um, it, is, it means that this didn't happen by accident. This park did not come here by accident. It was part of the design. And there's one of the descendants, um, Karen Pinnell, uh, 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 and she's there with the sign. Um, we had Civil War reenactors. Re James was there. It was a great day. All right. I'm, I'm in the home stretch, you guys, and James is about to come up, and we're going to ask some questions. You ready? Almost ready, James? About three more slides? Well, I doubt that I will be able to make it up there. Well, I'll help you. <laughs> Susan will help you. I'll come down. I'll send a crew down. Okay, so uh, back to the National Park Service. So I met with James and Tanya in 2018 after I met them, and I said, you know, do you have an agenda? Would you like, can I help with your agenda? And they said the first thing they wanted to be fixed was that exhibit up at Great Falls. And so there we had a meeting in June of 2018. There's James and Barbara and Tanya and me, and I don't know who that ranger is. That's Susan in the picture, and there's the chief historian of the National Capitol area and there's Alex who was the superintendent. We had a great meeting and then six months later they did a great job. But hold on, that's just the beginning because along came Fernice Sewell. This is just a month ago and Fernice and her team worked on this project for, I said it was a year, she corrected me, she, she said it was only eight months. But here is the superintendent, we have this beautiful birthday celebration. The National Park Service said, hey who owns that image? And we said, well, Historic Chevy Chase DC commissioned it, so we own it, you can use it. And they used it um, all over the place. The, it will be on next year's annual park pass. Uh, if you go to Great Falls and buy an annual pass for $35, you will see that painting. Um, and there is um, this beautiful picture of all the descendants and everyone who came out that day. It was a great day. Um, here is the new exhibit that they also unveiled. It's called Against the Current. Here's James and the family, uh, and here's Fernice and her team. It was a great day. It was an amazing day. Just a great day. So go to the, so, so the point now is, you know, the mission of the National Park Service is to interpret the history of the United States, and now the history of the United States includes George Pointer. Okay, just uh, two or three more slides. Along the way, UDC offered a class in oral history to these brilliant students who got very involved, and they did oral histories of eight of the descendants, very extensive oral histories, and they came out, here we are, walking around the park, and they started something called the Black Broad Branch Project that is all about reconciliation and reparations, and they organized this amazing hearing, uh, many of the descendants. There you are, Shirley. Uh, that's Shirley, there's, there's Jocelyn. Uh, there's James testifying about the reparations task force because yeah, that's on the agenda. That is on the agenda. Education in the social studies curriculum, um, an apology, an acknowledgement, and yes, return of the land. So the uh, Black Broad Branch project is ongoing. Um, we work a lot with them at Historic Chevy Chase DC, so we've archived it, and that's part of the Historic Chevy Chase DC online online museum. And uh, 
Uh, so we have a lot of events at historic Chevy Chase DC. Here are two. Uh, we had a great meeting that was, um, that was uh, moderated by Reverend Bill Lamar of the AME Church, uh, a wonderful moderator and really interesting um, fellow. And there are all the descendants talking about the meeting uh, and about what they would like to see happen. Many people talked about an apology, an acknowledgement. It should be taught in the schools. And I'm happy to say that Black Broad Branch is working with the DCPS social studies curriculum standards. Uh, what does repair look like? We had a world, one of the experts in the country, Dr. Linda Mann, with the African American Redress Network come and address. All of these are recorded on webinars and you can look at them anytime. And one of my favorite things that we did with the oral histories is um, Part of what Black Broad Ranch is doing is archiving them with the, with, uh, the, Wash with the uh, DC History Museum. But what we did in the meantime is we did these vignettes. Meet the descendants. And there is, uh, there's James, his older sister Tadatia, there's Tanya, there's Jocelyn, with little excerpts and you can go online and read these wonderful vignettes about their lives, what this history means to them, what they'd like to see done. And wait a minute, I didn't leave you off. Shirley and Susan, there's Shirley and Susan too. All right, that's my talk. I'm sorry I went on for so long. James, you wanna come on up? Come on up and let's have a little chat. I'm gonna ask James four or five questions and then we'll open it up. Just come on over this way. I think we both need a, a microphone. That one works. Come sit right here, James. Come oh, sit, right sit right here. Yeah, sit you right here. Oh, don't, don't step off the stage. Stay right over. Sit right there. Oh, sit? Sit right there. Yeah, yeah, because we're going to have a chat now. I'm going to ask okay. you questions. And all you have to do is hold it up right there like you're almost eating it. Give it a try. Testing one, two, three. We can hear you. We can hear you. Oh. As far as, uh, you know, my history, uh, history uh, what more is left for me to say? Well, James, of course, that's a good question. I was going to start off by saying, was there anything up there that I got wrong, or do you have anything on the top of your you mind? You did it ex a splendid job. I did okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. James, I do, let, let's go through just a couple of questions, and you guys need to hear from James. I like to say that, uh, you know, I do some nuts and bolts, but James is the heart and soul. Well, let, um, let me just say this first. Um, I'm glad that you came back later, uh, later after uh, stating uh, George Porter's, Captain George Porter's um, uh, position with the uh, um, canal um, was um, went from supervisory engineer to um, superintendent. Uh, there was some discussion at the round table with the author, uh, the the authors about uh, how how did he go, and it was a debate, and I still affirm that he was a superintendent. Right. Uh, he went as high as he could in in, in that company. Right. Um, so later you came back and you superintendent. Superintendent. That's what not I'm talking. Yeah. Uh, not just super. Not just supervisor. Superintendent, because he knew, he knew everything. Go ahead. The second thing is Dry Meadows was a village. It wasn't a farm. We call them farm here. In Africa, they call them villages. Right. They're made up of family members. Quite a few villages start from family. And as the family grows, the village adapt, they adapted the village to the family. And that's what they did on Dry Meadows. Uh, once they uh, divided, once the sons got older, they divided the land up, built a house on it for, for sons, and so on. So I would just like to add that. I think that's really important to add, James. Um, you called it a home place, too. Uh, it was a home place in a village. And of course, when that's lost, there's a real damage. But let's start. Uh, you did not know about this history growing up. Is that right? Not at all. 
When did you find out about Captain Pointer and Dry Meadows? Um, uh, uh, Tanya, I, I was visiting Tanya my, uh, Tanya, my good friend, and I just mentioned that she was uh, uh, working on Ancestry Calm uh, for another, for some other people, and mapping their family tree. I mentioned to her over, over my lifetime, uh, I uh, had wanted to uh, explore my family tree. And um, I didn't get the last word out, and she was at the table and ignoring me. Uh, so um, uh, there it began. And after, after maybe a week or two, because she works fast, um, we had mapped maybe three generations, two and a half, three generations, and uh, maybe a week and a half later, uh, we received the email from Tiggy and Barbara. Hey, you know you have a family, or you have a famous uh, ancestral grandfather? So I had to read that three times. Um, so we got in touch, um, and we shared information, uh, what Tanya and I had, uh, gathered, and, um, we started to compare notes and, and jointly do research. Um, of course, Tanya and I on one end, verifying what they, uh, they, they, they found, or, uh, giving our opinion on what may be a gray area in the research. Um, so that was fun. Um, and I really appreciate them, of course, uh, for, for laying out uh, the discovery and to submitting uh, our, you know, legacy in the book form uh, and having us participate. Uh, and um, so uh, that's very special. Um, Did they take you to uh, the park for the first time? Uh, yes, they also took us to um, visit the uh, the cottage. Likeness. Yeah, oh, the, oh yes, at the at Great Falls Park. Exactly. Um, um, it just took my breath away. Uh, my um, Family tree journey is uh, is a bittersweet one because um, it was ours. Uh, it was the glue that held the family together. It was a place where um, family returned to heal, to bond. Um, it was uh, the place where generations of the kids would um, learn and grow and uh, be inspired and supported. So it was everything to us. Um, and from the very beginning, uh, one, I had two questions. I wanted to know what fractured our family. Um, I wanted to know, you know, uh, if there was anything expiring about our family, um, our ancestors, and also what fractured the family. And during my journey, I learned that at that point, at the point when, when we, when the land was taken, when our village was destroyed, um, that's the point of family destruction. You were scattered all around D.C. Uh, so um, that was trauma that we never recovered from. Let me ask you this, James. You know, when you speak about your two questions, was there anyone inspiring in your family tree? And the question of, of what was the, the cause of the fracture, if if you had known this as a kid growing up, do you think it would have made a difference in your life? Well, one, um, it could have. Right. 
How so, do you think? Um, greatly. My family is women-driven. <laughs> I, I, I had no uh, male role model at all. I, I was quiet. My sister reminded me, like, uh, not long ago, that I, I was like a ghost. And I was, I had to think about that, and I said, yeah, right. I was quiet, um, and I was just trying to figure the world out. You know, I had adult questions, um, um, and I was just—I I wasn't getting the the truth. I was getting whatever I was getting, but it wasn't the truth. I didn't believe it because it was different from what I was seeing. So, um. let me ask you this. In all of the, um, you know, these efforts, you, starting with your, you know, but you, you're a tenure working on the family reunion in 2015, all these other efforts. Is there anything that stands out to you that, you know, was particularly meaningful, impactful, that you liked, that you didn't like? Let me go back. Sure, I yeah. Really, I, I didn't really answer. If, if had I known George George Point existed, and he was an uh, ancestral grandfather when I was young. It, would, it, it may have impacted me greatly in a positive way. Right. I've heard others. I'm sorry, you raise your hand? Yeah, wait till you finish. Okay, that finished me. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, one, one second. Before, hold, I know there's some good questions coming. Let me just ask one or two more things, because I think James, James is, you know, we're getting to the heart and soul now, and I don't want to cut you off, but I'm just, let's go to the redress part, James, because, you know, in the oral histories and in the events we've hosted this year, especially the, the webinar with Reverend Lamar, right, um, a lot of discussion about reparations, what forms of redress. Your family and others have talked about apology, acknowledgement from the D.C. government, education, making sure that uh, students uh, learn about this history. Um, and, of course restoration of the land, compensation, what would you like to see happen? Well, given that our family didn't get, didn't receive 40 acres in a mew, um, I really meant what I said, we want the land back. You can hold the apology, because an apology is just like someone taking your food and apologizing for, for it while you had still had that empty stomach. <laughs> That's, the That's the truth. That's the truth. Well said. Well said. So um, it made no sense to me if someone says apologize to a child still, you know, and the child don't mean it, then they apologize. Right. You know, right, right, their right. mother or their father, their parents want them to. Right. It, it's a lesson in it, but... Um, I like for, uh, secondly, and most, most importantly, I like for uh, the, the real, true, fair uh, African-American uh, history taught to, especially, you know, to, to kids in school. Um, before they get busy, before they get up an age where their interests is more important than most other things uh, outside of education. So, um, you know, it was heartfelt when, you know, Tim and I, you know, talked at, you know, the elementary school uh, uh, kids and to see their enthusiasm, their interest, and their passion. And, you know, they're going to come up with these questions that some may not want them you know, uh, want, want, want them um, to ask. Uh, but, you know, you, you teach your kids very early from the start what's right and wrong. And if they know our history, they're going to look at you and say, that's wrong. <laughs> and then you want to say, well, hmm, what to do? Right. So, um, but there's, there's an answer. There are answers. You know, you, you, there's answers. So, but then, you know, you just have to deal with it. But, you know, 
we know, but it's just a whole lot of denial right in front of our face. It's easier to just deny. Right. <laughs> so um, those are the two important items that should be addressed because I think um, for my, my family, you know, it'll be helpful. And for the future generations of, you know, this diverse country, uh, with the children coming up, they'll be better suited to deal with the diversity. But the truth, and, 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 and giving the truth early on. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions. Are we okay on time, uh, Cindy? Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, does anyone want to take the microphone around? I'll, I'll give up mine. Or can you, can you be loud? I speak loud. Very good, very good. Marcy, stand up. What's your question? My question is, uh, actually, how was the amount determined as reparations for what was done to your family? Actually, the stolen land that was by the government, how can you really get that back? And how much was it? Well, we can ask for that. That's Sorry? We can just ask for that. Yeah, but you, how much did you know to ask for? Maybe that's my question. It was taken, the land was taken, and... What is it assessed for now? Is there any assessment? And, and you want it back. Uh, so it, Marcy's asking about money, but James, you're talking about getting the land back, right? Yes, Not, land. You don't want the money. You want the land back, right? And then if, yes, exactly. You want the land back. Now, if someone wants to rent the land back from us, that's when we negotiate. <laughs> well said. Well said. Uh, the sh by the way, that's a great question, Marcy. And one of the fifth graders, one of the fifth graders said, very much, Mr. Fisher, how much did you get, and was it enough? The answer to that question is, uh, Mary Moten got about $6,600, but of course it wasn't enough, and it was in 1928. And there, of course, are examples now. Uh, on the website, Dr. Mann talks about, maybe you've heard of Bruce's Beach uh, in, in, um, in, in, uh, in California, where, where the, um, the land actually was given back to the family and then the family sold it. They decided they, they sold it. So they sold it for millions of dollars. Uh, it's a great question. It was a great question. And the fifth graders asked. But, you know, fifth graders ask good questions. Yes, ma'am. Deal is 
It was the whole thriving black community that was, uh, dif dis uh, uh, yes, they, they uh, so, you know, it's hurtful. I mean, after living there, uh, 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 supporting one another, uh, uh, they had great support. They even started uh, almost their own insurance, and just, in, just in case someone lose their job. Uh, uh, so they had, they had a way, and they made their lives uh, uh, simpler and easier. So all of that was disrupted. Yes, ma'am, way in the back. She, she thinks it should be called Pointer Park. Pointer Park, not Lafayette. Yeah. Thank you so much. Did you hear the question, James? Well, um, as I said, um, my, my uh, family tree journey is, was bitter and sweet, sweet and bitter. But my pride is permanent in my family, in my family's history. That's permanent. But the journey um, and um, one of the bitter parts was um, that the, the park was not named um, entirely um, consist of, you know, family. And Tim and some other people felt my bitterness and my rage. Um, some people would come to me uh, doing, even doing the um, ribbon cutting and why What's, what's going on with the name? It made no sense. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, and Tim said he had to compromise. That was, that was the best they could do. But I didn't attend that meeting. I wasn't invited. <laughs> I'll say this. I, I wish, in retrospect, we had just gone for Pointer Park. It wasn't my idea, but it was discussed that we should go for half a loaf. And I wish we had gone for the whole loaf, James. Amen. I was, I was Amen. invited. Amen. To attend yes, that right. particular meeting. What 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 history did is did, did the first name play in in in, in that on that land? Yeah, I get that. Had that had that person stepped foot on that land? No, I get that. So uh, it made no sense to me. I debated with them what sense. Okay, he, he, he was for um, uh, the abolishment of slavery, you know, and his name is all over the place. Why does it have to remain on that land? And it's at the school, I guess. All of, no, Excuse the me? school is still named for him. The school, the elementary school. No one well, well, well. School. When we talk about um, my family's village, we uh, is often said that a school was built there. But the greater, you know, the, that park, the park is there, yeah. and and. Uh, our land encompasses the, the park. Right. So that all of that area, was okay, the whole area, was our, our village. But we keep saying a school. We took the land because of the school. That's not 
totally correct. So, um, you know, no, I, I, Oh, Susan, you're here. Hi. Hi. Susan Finta, everybody, from the National Park Service, who was in the original meeting. Thank you, Susan. Um, let me first say that, you know, what you have done um, is great, it's magnificent. I really love what came out of, you know, my, my first visit there. Um, I was enraged <laughs> when I first walked in the door and discovered that you know, um, George Pointer representative was there, but his name wasn't. And I asked for top management, and I asked the question, do you know who that represents? And I got no response. And later on, there was a change in leadership or whatever, uh, people who were waiting for a family member to show up because they knew who he was and how important he was. And things started happening. And, 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 and um, you know, I, uh, I commend the website, uh, which I've done. Right now, what I would like every American to do acknowledge and assist me with having George, uh, uh, Captain George Porner installed in the African American History Museum, where he belongs. He, he, he needs recognition for that. He, I mean, this is his area. And I noticed over some years that, um, uh, you know, really, some lesser people are up in there. And um, as I see it, they're taking his spot. <laughs> I guess we better stop there. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Thank you, AOI. And, and we, have, we have certificates, as we always do, thanking our speakers. We have a AOI coins. Oh my God, coins. Can I melt this down? No, you can't melt it down. <laughs> Thank you so much. And our certificates. Oh, it's a challenge coin. It's, it's the challenge coin, yeah, that's right. That's great. I think we have. Before I leave, I, I'd just like to thank everyone, everyone, Neil, whatever, everyone to help. It took a, it took a wonderful crowd of people to come together, gravitate, and support um, what we've done thus far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Look over here. Oh, oh he's taking a good, picture of us. Great picture of us. Thank you. No, no.